So Yud Gimel Aleph. Rabbi Eliezer says, one who weaves on Shabbos is liable um, if he wove three threads at the beginning, or if he adds one thread to a pre-existing woven fabric. And the rabbis say, both at the beginning and at the end, its measure for liability is two threads. One who makes a base, one who makes two meshes, i.e. ties the threads of the warp, attaching them to either the nirin or the kiros. Um, I don't have a translation for those. Um, they're, 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 there was a large loom and this, there was a home loom and there was a professional loom. Oh, right, right. Um, in a winnow, sieve, or basket is liable for making meshes. And one who sews is liable if he sews two stitches. And one who tears is liable if he tears enough fabric in order to sew two stitches to repair it. Gimel. One who, who rends his garment in anger or in anguish over his dead relative is exempt. And anyone who performs labors destructively on Shabbos is exempt. One who performs labor destructively in order to repair is liable. His measure for liability is the amount of one who performs that labor constructively. Right. In other words, enough enough to be able to perform the the labor constructively. Mm -hmm. I imagine my my kids have that yeah. uh, that Shabbos Malacha book, the illustrated yeah. one. Yes. So the, the example they give is a kid knocking down a wall with a sledgehammer or a kid knocking down a wall with a sledgehammer because there's a pipe behind it that he wants to go right. and fix. Yes, right. Exactly. That's the idea. Okay. Um, although. So that, that's actually a bad example. It would be like yeah. you know, want to knock down the wall. Yeah, in order to, in order to build it up better. You know, you're not you. If you knock down, if you knock down the wall because you see it's crooked and you want to rebuild it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe because it. Maybe the example there is it's like wet and he needs to just. He needs to, build it back again after he mm. fixes it. Yeah. I'll have to go back and look at that because you're right. Now that I say it out loud, that is wrong. So I had this interesting, I don't know if a completely random thing that popped into my head. But I noticed that there was one place in in London. We were walking down a fairly steep hill and I was looking at the house that we were walking next to and I thought, this is very odd. Because normally when people build a wall on a on an, on an incline, mm -hmm. you know, the, the bricks are, are still horizontal. And you just you know sort of step the wall so that it just so it goes up like that. This one had the wall had the bricks laid along the slope. So the so the, the wall <laughs> itself was was actually at this funny slope. And it's like, this is making me feeling feel a little disoriented. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. <clears throat> yeah, that was pretty weird. Okay. Um, uh, so she or ha melabin and menapets va tove va tove. So for those the the shear for um, for uh, bleaching and for menapets is is coming and for tove is dying. Va um, tove and the one is twisting. Kimlo rocha va sit katul. Um, the 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 shear for that is the full width of a double sit. So now a sit is the gap between your uh, your index finger and your middle finger, and a sit kaful is the gap between your uh, your index finger and your thumb, which is double. Apparently, I, I haven't actually measured it, but apparently it's roughly double the, uh, which intuitively just seems about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About right. Um, anyway, so that's so the 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 sit kaful that's the that's the distance between thumb and, and forefinger. Um, okay. Um, the the oreg shnei chutin, and somebody who <coughs> who weaves to um to who weaves two threads, um, has shiro kim lo hasit. So this is also the the shear is the um, a melo a sit. Um, I don't think, I think it's, is it double? Sorry, is it? Or it's Somebody pushes puts two um, 
two two uh, two threads of a rev of of uh, uh, of weft into the into the warp. Uh, the shear is uh, the shear in the in the width of the arig. How, how how far does he have to go into it? Is mm -hmm. Camilo has it once he's gone once he's gone that le length into the into the weft in, into the into the warp. Uh, that's considered. Uh, and that's considered a, a malacha, even though even though he hasn't got the full width width of the of the of the cloth, he's just gone that small amount um, is the, the, the in other words the, 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 this distance between index finger and and middle finger that's already he's already high. Rabbi Yehuda Omer Hatzad Tipor the Migdal Utzvila Bias. Now we're going into uh, into hunting. Uh, catching an animal. So if somebody hunts a bird and chases it into a into a closet, <clears throat> or or similarly, he chases a, a deer into into a house. He's kind of okay because now he's trapped it. That, that that's called trapping. So there's the tzad is the is the is the trapping and the and the shochet is the is the shkita. They're two separate actions and each one each one is a separate al uh, malacha. Chachamim say no. You, uh, the tipoy le migdal. You write about the bird into the into the uh, closet. But tzvi le bias ve lechatzer ve Also, uh, if you uh, chase the, the the deer not just into an enclosed house, but even into an enclosed yard or bivarin is um, a place uh, is basically some sort of animal pen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, like says enclosure. Enclosure, yeah. Um, Rabban Shimon bin Gamliel Omer, no palavi varin shavin. You know, there are enclosures and there are enclosures. I mean, we could say that, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a private game reserve is also an enclosure because it's got a fence around the area. But just because you chase the deer into, the, into this enclosure doesn't mean that you that you caught it. Mm -hmm. um, so he explains the position of Chazal. He says, no palavi varin shavin, zeklal. Basically, if you would still have to work hard to catch this animal once it's inside, then you're pater for trapping it. But if it's a, but if it's a, if it was already, um, but but if it, but if it's already in a situation where, like, let's say, you know, the deer inside the house hasn't got far to go, right? So it's it's a very simple matter for somebody to walk in and just grab it. And if, if that's the case, if it's if it's easy to walk in and grab an animal, then it's already trapped and you're kind of for, for trapping it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, now, so uh, let's say um, a deer wasn't even, you know, just wandered into the house and somebody said, yeah, got it, and slams the door. That's kind of, because now he's trapped it. It could have gotten out before. Now he's now he's effectively trapped it, even though he didn't even chase it into the house. Okay. Now Lushnayim, what happens if two people come and, and trap it? Now, interesting why we're getting into this question now because we we said this about Hotza. I remember we had, we had two people you know two people carrying an object into the Rishos Rabim. We said the Pater, unless the object is so heavy that uh, that you need two people to carry it out. And Rabbi, mm -hmm. uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon says never hire with two two people doing it. So we get the same breakdown of of positions over here. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's a heavy door and you need two people to close it, then yeah, then both of them are Rabbi Shimon Pote. So it's exactly the same positions that we have in this Mishnah. Why do we mention this at all in this context? Because we'll see in tomorrow's Mishnah is from in, well, in, in, in Mishnah Zion, um, which is for tomorrow, uh, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have some uh, some combinations of uh, of of who did it and uh, who, who's who's high and who's potter. Okay, yeah. If it was just this, then it would be like, well, we've we've already talked about. We covered this. this, yeah. So it's it's setting up our it's setting us up for for tomorrow's uh, for tomorrow's mission. Okay, cool. Okay, um, back to Tess Hay. Tess Dodd Hay. Um. Okay, one who carries out wood on Shabbos is liable for a measure equivalent to the amount of wood necessary to cook an easily cooked egg. The measure of liability for carrying out spices is equivalent to that which is used to season an easily cooked egg. 
and all types of spices joined together with one another. The measure that determines liability for carrying nut, uh, nutshells, pomegranate peels, safflower, and madder, which are used to produce dyes, is equivalent to the amount that is used to dye a small garment atop a woman's hairnet. The measure that determines liability for carrying out urine, natron, and borit, chamoleon earth, and potash, all of which are abrasive materials used for laundry, is equivalent to the amount that's used to launder a small garment placed atop a woman's hairnet. Rabbi Huda says the measure um, for these materials is equivalent to that which is used to remove a stain. Vav. The measure for carrying out pepper on Shabbos is any amount. Similarly, the measure that determines liability for carrying out tar is any amount. The measure for carrying out various kinds of perfumes of various kinds of metals is any amount. The measure for stones of the altar or earth of the altar um, let's see. I forget if mine adds stuff here. So sacred scrolls are the coverings that became tattered due to an insect mm -hmm. called a mekek. That's my commentary. Okay, that's or just uh, the, the other mekek we've got. Um, yeah, it's or or else it's uh, it's the part that's been um, been chewed off by the uh, by bookworms. Oh yeah, he also yeah. says yeah, it's called it's called a mekek. and mekek that destroys their coverings is any amount. So I guess we're talking about Geniza. Stuff. Yes, that's right. That's exactly the point is, is we carry on. That's because people store them, yeah. Geniza, in order to bury them. Uh, Rabbi Huda says, even one who carries out accessories of idolatry on Jabez is liable in any amount, as it stated in there shall cleave nothing of the proscribed items to your hand. Um, okay. Yeah. Zion. One who carries out a merchant's basket, even if there are many types um, of, my commentary adds spices and jewelry in it, is obligated to bring only one sin offering because he performed only one act of carrying out. Um, the measure for liability of garden seeds is less than a fig bulk. Rabbi Yehudas ben Basira says, the amount is five seeds. The measure for cucumber seeds is two seeds. Um, my commentary adds because they are large and conspicuous. The measure for squash seeds is two seeds. The measure for carrying out seeds of Egyptian beans is two. The measure that determines liability for carrying out live kosher locusts is any amount. Uh, for carrying out a dead kosher locust, which is edible, is the same as any other food, which is a fig bulk. The measure that determines liability for carrying out the locust called Tsiporet keramim, whether alive or dead, is any amount. That's because one stores them for medicinal purposes. Um, Rabbi Yehuda says, even one who carries out a live non-kosher locust is liable for carrying out any amount because people store the locusts for a child who wants to play with it. And that's the minority opinion because uh, because the majority opinion holds that people don't give their children uh, non kosher locusts to play with in case they die and the child eats them. <laughs> okay, Bikurim Alapay. Okay, just got to navigate there. One second. Alapay. Yeah. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says, a woman who is a daughter of a convert may not marry a priest unless her mother was herself an Israelite. Um, this law applies equally to the offspring, whether of proselyte, of Gerim or freed slaves, even to 10 generations, unless their mother is an Israelite. So well, I guess when he's saying- it, it, it Definitely the father is an Israelite. I mean, it's, then they take, the, then they're not to marry one in. So this is his, that's, um, he actually gave, brought another opinion um, in Kasubos, is it? Or is it Kibushin? Um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a Rabbi Yossi who says that, uh, that 
and they're there, there the time as long as she's born as long as she's born Jewish she's allowed to marry a coin um, and the and the halacha the halacha we said was that um, so this this girl who's born to parents who, who had converted mm-hmm. so she's born Jewish but she's born to parents who are converts um, yeah. if they ask the shaila then we say no we've got a person like Rabbi Yosef and Yaakov but if they went ahead and got married then we don't force him to divorce her because uh, because we have a town who says that it's mutter. Mm-hmm. So this particular mission here is saying the woman daughter of a convert. When she when he's saying daughter of a convert, he comes to clarify that that is both parents. She can convert. marry if if the dad if the dad is the convert and the mother is the if is either the, one if has he, if, if either one of them is born Jewish, then then the shaila doesn't begin. Okay. Um, a guardian, an agent, a slave, a woman, one of doubtful sex, or a hermaphrodite bring the Bikurim, but do not recite, since they cannot say which you, O oh Lord, has given to me. Yeah, because they don't, they're not in the Pasha of, of inheritance. So since they don't, since they don't inherit with, um, with, with their uh, brothers? Whatever the right? because uh, the, the land is for the hermaphrodite and the and the tumtum, the brothers will say, "Well, prove to us that you're a, that, that you're a male, and then you'll say, you can take your portion." Interesting. I was going to say, well, a woman. We have this whole, this whole like thing about that, but that's yeah. only if there are no brothers. So fine. Yes. So right. So that's so that's actually the interesting position is that uh, that's a, that's. That's an interesting question because the the woman uh, um, in Slokhad, yeah, he, he has a footnote over here. In the Indian of the the, children, yeah. the daughters of Slokhad, Tosfos Yerusha says that uh, it wasn't in the Torah of Chalukah that they took it, but it was in the Torah of Yerusha. Oh, because right, we're here. We're talking about Chalukah. So when the when yeah. the land was originally divided, Hashem Nasata Li Hashem originally divided and given it was given to the males right the heads of the heads of the household right and so had none of these and, and they and they received it via their father right so he received it mm-hmm. and they inherited it so we're not talking inheritance we're talking about okay that makes total sense okay cool um hey vav one who buys two trees um, that had grown in property belonging to his fellow brings Bikurim, but does not recite the declaration. Rabbi Meir says he brings and recites. If the well dried up or the tree was cut down, he brings but does not recite. Not sure what a well has to do with anything, but okay. Rabbi Huda says he brings and no, recites. Uh, well, because, because the well was, was, uh, was irrigating the tree. It was living off the water from that tree. Now, if the water dries up, that tree, that tree is going to die soon. It's going to die. Oh, okay. So, dead tree walking. Rabbi Huda mm-hmm. says he brings and recites uh, from Atzera, from Shavuos until the festival, Sukkot. He brings and recites from the festival, Sukkot, until Hanukkah. He brings but does not recite. Rabbi Huda of Sarah says he brings and recites. Zion. If one sets aside his Bikurim and afterwards sold his field, he brings but does not recite. The second one who brought who bought the field does not bring Bikurim of the same species, but of another species he brings and recites. Maybe Huda says he may also bring of the same kind and recite. Trumos Aleph Love. Trumos Aleph. Uh-huh. Okay. Five may not give truma, but if they do, their truma is truma. A mute person, a drunk person, one who is naked, a blind person, or one who has seminal omission, they may not give truma. But if they did, their truma is valid. They may not give truma according to measure or weight or number, but one may give it from that which has already been measured, weighed, or counted. They may not give truma in a basket or a hamper of a measured capacity, but one may give it 
when it's half or third filled. You can eyeball it, I guess. Mm -hmm. He may not give a half of a, of a se'a in a se'a measuring vessel, for this constitutes a known measure. Right. The trimmer, so tr the deal of trimmer is that it has to be estimated. Okay. And chess. Uh, so they may not give truma from oil for crushed olives, nor may they give truma from wine for, of, uh, for trodden grapes. If he did so, his truma is truma, but he must give truma again. The first truma renders on its own produce into which it falls uh, doubtful truma. It is subject to the added fifth, but not the second. The second one is a chumra. The first, the first trimmer, the, the taking the wine for the for the grapes that are about to be crushed into wine, you shouldn't do this lechachila, and that's why they say that if you did it, we make you take trimmer again from the from the from the grapes. But mm -hmm. the first one is actually the ikar trimmer, because it, it, it really did work. Mm -hmm. So you're taking from a finished product for an unfinished product. You shouldn't have done it, but at least it, you can't do it the other way. You can't take from the unfinished product for the finished product. That doesn't work. But, but in the other direction, it does work, but we make you take Truma again as, uh, um, so it, I don't know if it's a Knas. Uh, do they call it a Knas or is it just? Um, um, it's a knas as a as a get a tara to make sure that you that you do things for the tara. Okay. Next. Um taras, as we were saying. Hey Vav. Okay. Hey. If there were two loaves, the one unclean and the other clean, and a man ate one of them and then prepared clean food, and then afterwards another man came and ate the second loaf and then prepared clean food, Rabbi Huda rules if each by himself asks for a ruling, they are both declared clean. If they are asked simultaneously, both are declared unclean. Rabbi Yossi ruled in either case, they are both unclean. Uh, Zion. If a man sat in a public domain and someone came and stepped on his clothes or spat as he and he touched his spit, uh, on account of the spit, truma, uh, on account of the spit, truma must be burnt. But on account of the clothes, the majority principle is followed. That's um, according to what, what are most people? Are most people uh, in this area? Um, ah. Are they um, Zabin? So what's the what's the rove? And then we go by the rove. Um, um, that, that's not, so the majority, if, if most of the people in the city are, 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 are Zabin, then you say, okay, so then, then my clothes are now Tami Midras. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's it's quite a, it would be quite a remarkable situation to have the majority of people in the town being Zabin because, uh, you know, that's, it's not a common condition. Yeah. Um, but with the spit, is that because it's wet? Then it because, could be any kind of truma, or could it be any kind of tuma that um, so jumps over the, to him? Um, so the spit is also from a wait, why? Yeah, that's a good question. Now, why on the roof? Even after she nagged a rope, nagged a truma, so if he makes a truma, of course, she means she also said, like, rook him and eat him, so if he makes a truma, um, because the spit, yeah. I mean, I get like, why is it so why, I get why, why the FDA it? would be interested in that. Like, <laughs> don't touch somebody's spit and then make food, you gross person. <laughs> but, so why don't you say the same thing? That's actually a good question. Why don't you say the same thing for the, for the spit and say that well, maybe it's... Uh, um, uh, so you go after the majority of people and say, okay, so the, the spit comes from, from somebody who's from the majority. Um, 
Well, let's see. That's an interesting question. Why does not? Why is it different? Um, very successful so this is i mean we say this in the in the in the in the previous mission we gave, we we had we said al safik rukima nimtaim sarfim is a trauma so we, even from a safik we of those particular things of uh, you know of the of the of the of the spit in the in the uh i mean time if you find if you, and you don't know what the source is because it's a suffix that it might come from a zav for that based on based on that we will burn the garment but if somebody just treads on his clothing tread treads on his clothing if somebody just treads on his clothing then we just then we go after majority which because it's not it's not in that list there's something there's something about that list over there that uh, i think that mm -hmm. is that a, a fazal that they said okay we're going we go after the we go after majority we, we don't go after majority here interesting that they say that's that, that's that's on this uh, this way because yeah it says it says in a previous mission Shema hem mizav or menida, because uh, because it might come from a zav or from a nida. A nida is a much more common condition. Um, uh, yeah, that was my thought. Is that perhaps the spit? It, it's a it's a broader category. Like I don't know what the, I don't know what this person was. Were they a zav nida? They could be avatuma from a mace or who knows what. Mm. No, well, no. If somebody's a, if somebody's a, a tame mace, their spit isn't tame. It's only, oh, yeah. it's, it's only Nida and Zav. Oh, oh, well, there you go. Okay, so that, yeah. I mean, that right there, though, makes sense. That expands, well, no, because it could be a Zava, like. Mm -hmm. But I guess you're right. It is a more common, as you're saying, it's not so common for the for there to be a city full of Zavia. Exactly, but yeah. Nida, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. But perhaps oh. it's a... Uh, oh, my place. Is after the rob. Because if you saw the person, here's another thought. If you saw the person, you can tell if it's a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. So men among men, there are very few zav. Among women, there are quite a lot of nidas. So yeah, it says uh, it's, it's a, it's, it looks like ba echad bedaras al begadab. So it looks like a man came and walked to him. That's very clearly a man, and so it's not such a such a uh, such a a, uh, um, a strong chance that he's a zav. But if there's spit. Could come from a man or a woman. You wouldn't know, and uh, and you're combining the the males of him with the female nidas and zavos, and now mm, perhaps that's the that's what the, the, what Chazal were thinking when they when they goes there on the saliva. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, cool. Yeah, carry on. Uh, okay. Yes. Um. Oh no, Did, I, no, no didn't I didn't finish, finish that one. Um, if a man slept in the public domain, when he gets up, his clothes have midras. Tuma, that's Rav Meir. But the Chachamim say, the sages say they're clean. If a man touched some, so it's just whenever. Is he just thinking, because Rav Meir says that for sure during the night, if he steps, if he steps in the street, somebody's going to step gonna over him. him and, and <laughs> there lots of people, everyone's going to be stepping over him. And somebody, somewhere in there is going to be a Zav or a Nida. If a man touched someone in the night and it's not known whether it was one who was alive or dead, but in the morning he got up and found him to be dead. Rav Meir says that he is clean. But the sages rule that he is unclean, since all doubtful cases of uncleanliness are determined in accordance with their appearance at the time they are discovered. Rav Meir right. says, "I don't. You touched that guy. He's dead now. But who knows what happened when you touched him? Right. At that point. Okay. And the halacha follows the chacham that we go according to the the current status quo, and we wrote it back and say, well, if he's dead now, he was dead then. Yeah. Yes. If there was in the town one who was not of sound sense, a Gentile or a Samaritan woman, um, all spit encountered in the town is deemed unclean. Mm -hmm. If a 
woman stepped on a man's clothes or sat with him in a boat. If she knew that he was one who eats truma, his clothes remain clean. But if not, he must ask her. Right, so if she's sitting, if she's sitting in, the, um, in, in the boat and she knows that, he, and he knows that she knows that he's a coin, then, then he doesn't have to ask her any questions because he knows that if she's a nether, she'll tell him. Why? Because she knows that, that just her upsetting the boat, she doesn't even have to touch him in order to move him uh, in order to make him tummy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so he can rely on the fact that if she were Tame, she would have told him. But if he doesn't know her and uh, he doesn't know that uh, that she know he doesn't know whether she knows that he's a coin, he has to say to excuse me, ma'am, I must ask you, I'm a coin. Are you by any chance a nida? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a wrong personal question. And so yeah, but I need to know if I can eat trim or not. Uh, so okay, fine. Need to know. Yeah. Need to know, and he needs to know. And the other, if the, the ratio is talking about people who uh, aren't going to be careful. Yes, people who aren't going to be careful. And there's a gazera on all of the non-Jews and on Samaritans that they are considered as, uh, as Zavos. And therefore, they, they, they'll be Matame. They, even their saliva will be Matame. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting that Tuma applies to Goyim. Yes, I it didn't it's, a even like... it's a it's a gazera that Chazal made. Okay. The Minatora it does not apply. Yeah, I could see a kushi like because it's sort of a, an edge case, but right. Okay. Uh, was that uh, all for here? Yeah, that's it. Now we're into Menachos, Perik Vav Mishnah Zion. Menachos. So have a hard time finding this one. Uh... And say the question. Second, the second, the second question. Uh -huh. So it is. Um, and then the parakin mission again. Sorry. Okay, Slide my brain. Vav Zion. Vav Zion. Hey, Vav Zion. There it is. The flower of the Omer was sifted with 13 sifters, each finer than its predecessor. And the flower that emerged from the final sifter was sacrificed. The flour of the two loaves was sifted with 12 sifters, and the flour of the showbread was sifted with 11 sifters. Rabbi Shimon says they had no fixed number of sifters. Rather, it was the fine flour that was completely sifted that one would bring for all these offerings, as it stated, and you shall take fine flour and bake it, indicating that one does not fulfill his obligation until the flour will be completely sifted. However, whatever the number of sifters you need to do that. Zion Aleph. The flower of the loaves accompanying the thanks offering would come from a measure of five Jerusalem se'ah offering, which are equivalent to six wilderness se'ah. Right, because they changed the, they changed the size of the shiorim when they came to, from, from the midbar into Eretz Israel. Mm -hmm. the, the, this is equivalent to two ephahs, each ephah being three wilderness se'ah. These two ephahs are 20 measures of a tenth of an ephah. All right, there's a lot of math here. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm just trusting the don't, mission don't, that it did worry, it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 10 of these tenths were used to make leavened loaves, and 10 of these tenths were used to make unleavened loaves. Uh, I so eat now matzah. you see that it's, there, that it's an unequal division because you've got four different types of loaves in the Torah. Are you listening with the Torah here? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a Torah. Yeah. Okay. So, so there the, are the four different types of loaves. One of which was was chametz, but they don't divide the flour into four. Okay. They divide um, isaron. So the, the, the isaron and chametz. So the, there were ten for. Um, so isar isaron isaron lechala the isar of isaron matza of. So it's isar lechametz or isar lematza. So it was actually 50 50. Mm -hmm. And the so the, the chametz was actually half of the of the flour. And the other and the matza ones were divided, uh, got a third of that tin. So go ahead. Okay. Um, there are there are 10 tenths for the loaves of leavened bread, a tenth of an ephah per loaf. And there are 10 tenths for the loaves of matzah. 
And among the loaves of matzah, there are three types, loaves, wafers, and those poached in water, 10 loaves of each type. Consequently, there are three and one third tenths of an ephah for each and every type, three loaves per tenth. And in the Jerusalem measure, there were 30 kav, 15 kav for the loaves of leavened bread and 15 for the loaves of matzah. There are 15 kav for the loaves of leavened bread and one and one half kav per loaf. And there are 15 kav for the matzah. Among the loaves of matzah, there are three types. Again, loaves, wafers, those poached in water. Consequently, there are five kav for each and every type, two loaves per kav. Um, base. The loaves that accompanied the ram of the inauguration of the tabernacle would come parallel to the three types of matzah that accompanied the thanks offering, loaves, wafers, and those poached in water. Um, the loaves, Let's see, my commentary says, the loaves of leavened bread that accompanied the thanks offering were not brought with the ram of the inauguration. The loaves that accompanied the offering, okay. The loaves that accompany the offering that the Nazarite brings upon completion of his period of Nazarite ship would come with only two parts of the three types of matzah that accompanied the thanks offering, namely loaves, wafers, but there's no matzah poached in water being invaded here. Can you hear me okay still? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Consequently, the loaves of the offering of a Nazarite are from 10 kav of fine flour, according to the Jerusalem measure, um, which equals six and two third tenths of an ephah, according to the wilderness measure. As each type of the loaves of matzah comes from three and one third tenths of an ephah. From all of the four types of loaves accompanying the thanks offering, one takes one loaf from each set of 10 as truma to be given to a priest, as is stated, and he shall present from it one of each offering as truma to the Lord, to the priest that sprinkles the blood of the set peace offering against the altar as it shall be given. The verse is analyzed. One indicates that one should not take a sliced loaf of each offering indicates that all the offerings should be equal. That is that one should not take a loaf from one type of offering for another. Mm -hmm. To the priest that sprinkles the blood of the peace offering against the altar, it shall be given and the rest of the loaves are to be eaten by the owner. Yeah, the, the Korban Toda is interesting is, um, I think it's the only, it's the only offering other than the, Kor the Korban Pesach that, uh, that there's a heel to consume it completely and not to leave anything over. And at the same time, the Korban Torah has a shortened time span. Normally, Shlamim is, is, has got two days to eat it. The Korban Torah, you've got the day and the night. And you've got extra food because you've got the Korban and you've got all this bread. So what this really forces the, the owner to do is it's like, he's not going to be able to eat this all by himself. He has to share with other people which forms of Pesume Nessa, why is he bringing, you know, he's bringing the Korban Torah because of his miraculous survival, whatever, he came out of jail, and he can share his good fortune with other people. He has to, he has to share it with other people because otherwise he's going to be over and leaving things over. Okay. Um, Nedarim Tes Zion. Nedarim, Nashim Nedarim, sorry, it was... Yud Tessayed. Uh, okay, the halakhic authorities may broach disillusion of a, for a person by raising the issue of his own honor and the honor of his children. For example, if he took a vow that resulted in his needing to divorce his wife, they may say to him, had you known that tomorrow people will say about you, this is the habit, Veset, of so-and-so, that he divorces his wives due to vows. And they will say about your daughters. I'm not sure which is commentary and which is not, but uh, are you, uh, it doesn't look like the mission I'm looking at. Uh, which one are you at? Tess, tess which is uh, you want the ones wrong. Zion, yeah. Yes, we'll get, we'll get there later. Do, do, do. Zion, Zion, that's much better. How so? Okay, what are we talking about? So we're talking about if, uh, if a nether is partially annulled, then, then the whole thing is annulled. 
Oh, right. He said, oh, I didn't know I, I wouldn't be able to eat meat on Shabbos. So they said, yeah. one, one says, one says, well, you, so you can eat meat on Shabbos, but not the rest of the week. Rabbi Kiva says that, that the whole thing's, the whole thing's gone. Yeah. Okay, how so? In the case of one who said, uh, I will not benefit from all of you, and it's Conan for me. Um, if you benefited from one of them is permitted, for whatever reason, benefit from all of them is permitted. However, if one said, I will not benefit from this one and that one, it's Conan for me. Then if you benefited from the first one is permitted, for whatever reason, then benefit from all of them. Right, if you this is if he chained his neighbor. He said, if he said to Ruvain, um, Conan, you, you're Conan to me. And then he said to Shimon, you're Conan to me like Ruvain. And then to Levi, uh -huh. he said, you're Conan to me like Shimon. So if, if, if Ruvain, if he then found a hitter for Ruvain, then everyone it, falls. It dominates out. Yeah. But if you benefit, if benefit from the last one is permitted, benefit from the last one alone is permitted, but benefit from all the others is forbidden. As uh, the commentary says, as benefit from each is considered to have been prohibited by a separate vow. I guess looking backwards. Yeah. yeah. If benefit from the middle one was permitted, then from him and below, i.e. all those enumerated after him, yeah. benefit is permitted. From him and above, i.e. those listed before him, benefit is forbidden. Um, okay. Another example of interconnected vows. If one stated, I will not benefit from this one as if he were an offering, and from that, and from that one as if he were an offering, that's Conan, right? Um, then an, uh, an extenuation enabling the dissolution of a vow is required for each and every one as they have the separate, as they have the status of separate vows. So him and him, that's different. Him yeah. like him. Yeah. Those are connected and, and contingent, I guess we'd Correct. say. Okay. Yes. If one stated in a vow, <clears throat> wine is conum for me and I will not taste it, as, wi as wine is bad for the intestines. And they said to him, well, but aged wine is good for the intestines. Then the vow is dissolved with regard to aged wine. And not only with regard to aged wine is it dissolved, but with regard to all types of wine since a vow that has part, been partially dissolved is entirely dissolved. Likewise, if one stated in a vow, onions are conan for me and I will not taste them as onions are bad for the heart. And they said to him, um, but this uh, kufari onion, this particular type of onion is actually good for the heart. Then in this case too, it's dissolved with regard to that kufari onion, um, but not with regard, but and not, not only onion. with regard to this particular type of onion, kufari onion, with regard to all types of onions. Uh, and, uh, there was a, an incident occurred and Rabbi Mayer dissolved the vow with regard to all types of onions. So this actually happened. Rabbi Mayer did it. Mm -hmm. Tess. Um, okay, we've heard this one a little bit already in, in my <laughs> error. Um, one may broach dissolution for a person by raising the issue of his own honor and the honor of his children. He took a vow for commentary says, for example, he took a vow that resulted in him needing to divorce his wife. That's the situation. They say to him, hey, look, had you known that tomorrow people will say about you, this is the habit of so-and-so that he divorces his wives due to vows. And they say about your daughters, look, they're the daughters of, uh, of divorce. Or they'll ask, what did their mothers uh, see to divorce? Thereby giving him a bad reputation. And if the man who vowed said, well, look, had I known that that was going to happen, had I known it was so, I would not have vowed, then it's dissolved. Okie dokie. That's us. Okay, great. Okay. Have a good day. Have a lovely day. See you in the session tomorrow. Be alert for the fact that I might, uh, that I might try, try and call for an early start if I sleep late and want to get to an 8 o'clock million. Okay. I will okay. be standing by. Thank you. See ya. See ya. Bye.